Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you could look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. Yeah, let's give God a round clap of praise, folks. Give God a hand clap of praise. For he is God. He's worthy to be praised. I want to challenge you on a message today that it's very easy in the world that we live in to think of politics based on how CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, or you know, whatever channel you choose to look at, whatever uh, structures you choose to believe in. Uh, and sometimes I must admit it's challenging to see that because it's as if God is not speaking. And it's interesting, we would treat him that way and when we know we write, read books like First, Second Kings uh, and all these different things. So today I want to challenge you to the scriptures. And for us to do that, we're going to turn to a bunch of scriptures, which Pierre warns me you're not really liking when I go, well, they ain't trying to do it in the book. They're doing it on the phone, so what are they tripping over? So <laughs> in my mind, you're not like you're looking like crazy. You're just flipping on a phone. So that should be easier, right? But especially with Wi-Fi and the building and all that stuff. So we're going to do some, I'm going to do this a Bible study way. I'm not in a necessarily sermonic way. Yeah, I might get fired up in a sermonic way. But I want to do this a Bible study structured way so you could see how God thinks in these times. I want you to see how he thinks. And I'm going to put a lot of this on online so you get a whole lot more notes that way. So let's turn first a passage that I'm not going to respond to in the midst of this sermon in Romans chapter 1. Because I want to explain to you the danger of not doing it this way. When you find Romans chapter 1, please stand and let us read quite a bit of that passage. Don't be tripping. Y'all look at movies for a long time. Y'all look at movies for a long time. You look at football games for a long time. Football games lasting three hours with commercials and breaks and when... The teams have overtime. Guess what you do? You stay the overtime. Some of y'all shop for eight hours, so give a brother a break. All right? <laughs> Let's just walk through this together. So this is a long passage, but I want you to see why people are thinking and functioning this way. This has been prophesied by God 2,000 years ago, and it's happening today. Here we go in verse 18 of chapter 1. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, even men who suppress the truth, who see it, know what the truth is, but shove it away. Okay, they push it down. The reason why it says suppress, because truth always fights for itself. You could only suppress it. You can't cancel it. He says, Because for that which is known about God is evident with them. Nobody turns on the sun or the moon. The earth spins. There's got to be a God operating it. For God made it evident to them. In other words, nobody could deny there is God. That's why it takes a fool to deny him. In verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, having been clearly seen, being understood through what is being made, so that they are not, they are without excuse. What has been made? Nobody makes a bird have a bird. Nobody makes a chicken have a chicken. Nobody could do any of that stuff. We could just buy them. We can't make them. He says in verse 21, he says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God 
or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations. People became more committed to their level of intelligence than the Bible. People think they could outthink God. And their foolish heart was darkened. They can't understand nothing anymore. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of, of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. People would miss church to take care of their dog. In verse 24, Therefore God gave them over because man turned his like away from God like this. God gave them over in their lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them for the exchange the truth of God for a lie. Suppress that truth. Worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. More people into animals more than ever. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them over to depraved, to degrading passions. For the women exchanged in a natural function for that which was unnatural. And the same also with men, abandoned the natural of function of the woman and burned in their desires towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty. Lots of sexual diseases. And he goes on. We are here today because we suppress truth. We don't care about the Bible anymore. We close it. And we go about making our own decisions. We act like God don't speak anymore because we got Google and Yugle and Boogaloogle. And we got all this stuff. We, we feel we got all of this. We got master's degree, doctorate degrees. We could do all this stuff. And the Bible says, okay, I'll hand you over to the way you think. See if you could fix the world. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that you're still speaking. You still stand. You're not a God who forces your will on us. You love us too much to do that. Well, God, your will will stand. And I pray, God, that we will learn from these texts how you think and submit to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Here's the first thing I want us to learn in this process as we study this text today, that when it comes to th this whole issue of who leads, who is the person that would lead the government in a country, in a, in a state, in a city, is something that God already did not mind having. He did not mind that taking place. The issue is when people decided to have that happen, they decided to reject God for it, and that's when the trouble started. So to show that God never had any problems with people leading his people, we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. So we don't forget, we're going to do some homework searching around here, and we will get through this succinctly. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. God will say that he had no problem whatsoever in people selecting governments and having kings. As a matter of fact, he's going to say to them, you are required by God to go select these people. In other words, you are biblically required to go and vote. It's not a suggestion. He's saying you need to go do it. Or you will not provide the influence of God in society because you stayed home. You looked at all the crazy stuff and you stayed home. So you did not let who God is became a part of the process by your vote. Well, it's just one vote. It takes one drop of water to fill a bucket. The more drops, the more it fills. So we are individually responsible before God, I will show, to go make our vote known. Because he says, you will decide your government. But I want to in invest myself into you so that when you go to vote, my investment in you is directed at the polls. He says it right here in verse 14. He says, I, I don't mind you having kings. Look at verse 14. He says, and when they entered the land in Deuteronomy chapter 17, which the Lord your God gives to you and possess it and live in it. So let me, let me give you a backdrop very quickly here. Now, here's the first thing. 
They're in the wilderness right now. They're getting ready to go into the promised land, okay? This was 40 years later because they didn't listen to God. Before I read the verse, at least get the backdrop to it. They, they didn't listen to God for 40 years. So the kids that were 20 years and below are now 60 years old or 59. And so they're standing now before Moses who's getting ready to die because Moses decided not to do what God said. So God says, you're not going to go into the promised land. Moses only got to the promised land and the Mount of Transfiguration. So Moses is, for the, is not going to see the promised land because he disobeyed God. But he's giving a sermon to the people, and he's telling them, when you go into this land, there's no more fire, no more cloud, no more manna from heaven. None of these things are taking place. You got to go plow the ground. You got to wait for your animals to have food. You got to have all these different things now take place, even though you're going to have houses already built. You're going to have land already in place. You're going to have animals already in front of you. You're going to have all these wonderful things flowing with milk and honey. So when you go into this land, you have to be able to operate in the land organized and succinctly, just like they did in the wilderness. In the wilderness, when there'd be two million people, Moses went and got a leadership structure. He had elders. He had people who served. Exodus chapter 18. He put together a leadership structure. So now that you're going into the land, that leadership structure is going to split up because you're going to be going into the different parts of the land based on your tribes. So you're going to split up in the land. And when you split up in the land, he says, I don't mind you having a king. This, this is the backdrop to this verse. Look at verse 14, the bottom part. And I say, I will set a king over you. Watch, watch the key word, personal pronoun. I will be the one who set a king before you. Okay? And like all the nations who are around you, who are around me, who's around you or around me? Me. His country, his people, his nation, he's the head of it. Church, he's the head of the church. People are saved, come to Christ because of him. So therefore, you are his people, right? Led by him who is king of the church, who is lord of the church. Same structure. And therefore, you belong to me, right? That's why you respond, you become like me as you grow up in the church. Same structure. What he says in verse 15, you surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, whom the Lord your God chooses. You got to underline that, remember that, as we walk our way through this passage, through this message. One from among the countrymen you shall seek as king. Why is he saying countrymen? He's saying that because if these countrymen, if a non-country person does it, they may bring in idols. They may bring in a different form of worship. They may not have God leading them. So since I'm the one leading you, I need somebody from among you who's being led by me to be the person who leads you. Watch this carefully. All of this was already worked out. You shall set as king up over yourselves, okay? So you have a responsibility too. It's, it's going to be led by me, but it's going, to be de, it's going to be decided by you. Watching me? Led by you, led by me, decided by you. How do you know that? Look at chapter 17. Look at verse 18. He says, you shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all your tongues. You shall do it, which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. That's why it's got to be your tribes. It's got to be your decision. And it has to be me directing it. Are you with me? That's why it's a biblical responsibility to go vote. It's not an option. Look at, verse, look at verse 16. Moreover, he shall, you can't, no, moreover, he shall not multiply for himself horses and return to Egypt and multiply horses. He's saying all this in verse 17. I'm going to summarize some of this. He's saying that also in verse 17. He's saying the person should not serve so they get rich. In other words, if they serve to get rich and use their rich to be all powerful because they're rich now because they're big and powerful and rich, he says it will corrupt them. How do you know that? Look at chapter 17. He's verse 19. He says, and you shall, this, he says, he says in the bottom part in uh, verse 18, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. You shall not take bribes. For the bribes blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So he says, don't go find people. Matter of fact, he says, Solomon sinned horribly. David too. He says, make sure the kings don't get to themselves many wives. Because that will corrupt them. And you saw that with Solomon. Solomon started getting a bunch of wives. He started worshiping all kinds of false gods. And it corrupted the whole nation. So he, he set the whole layout 
of who should be king, just like he would do, who's a pastor. He lays out who's a pastor. Just like you go buy an SUV and not a pickup truck. It's laid out what a pickup truck is. It's laid out what an SUV is. So when you make your choice, you look in those areas. When somebody goes looking for a job and they need a manager, they lay out a job description, qualifications. God does the same thing for his place. So he lays out who's this king, who selects him, who goes to vote for the person. He lays it all out and he says, make sure this person is not chasing money when they get in office. Because he says money, the love of money is the root of evil. They will be distorted the minute you give them the power and put a bunch of money onto them. And, they, and you know before you put that money, they love money. Even for a pastor, 1 Timothy 3, make sure a pastor is not a love of money. It corrupts. You can't have but one master. It can't be money, it'll be your master. God, you can master, but you can't serve two masters. So fundamentally, he's laid this out. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. They're getting ready to walk into the promised land. And guess what we're going to now? They're now in the promised land. And guess what they do? They reject God. When they choose to select the person over them, they told God to get out. Watch this carefully. Anytime a person loves money, they have a very difficult time fully surrendering to God. It's hard. Just, just think a person is a billionaire. They use health insurance, but do they really need it? They use car insurance, but do they really need it? The reason why they use it is to keep their billions. Okay, bottom line. So do they really need to come to church and pray God supply my needs according to your riches? They got money. So it's harder when a person is wealthy to actually truly surrender their lives to God. Because it's harder simply because it is easier to put their dependency on God than on Christ, than on the money. So, he says in 1 Samuel 8, easier to put their dependency on money rather than God. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. Let's go there. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, they're now in the land. They're now situating themselves in the land. They got God's leader in the land. This is, this is God's leader. It is Samuel. And Samuel is their leader, but Samuel's sons are not good sons. And Samuel is getting old. So they come to Samuel and they say, Samuel, we got a problem. You're getting old. Your sons can't take over because they ain't no good. Okay? Thank God I don't have that problem here. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Get Pentecostal up in here. Okay, but he says, you know how to, he says, you got a problem, Samuel. So they come to Samuel and say, Samuel, we already got a king. We know who he is, Saul. He's tall, he's strapping. Matter of fact, you know he's tall because they would say when Saul gathered among the nation of Israel, he was the tallest among everybody. So they, they, they wanted to, they decided this person, and Samuel got a little corrupted by this too because Samuel, when he went to look for David, he went to David's brothers who looked tall. And strapping. Why? Because they could fight off the enemy. The Philistines was a pest to them. And God said, because you didn't do what I said when you go into the promised land, the people in the promised land will be a pain to you. And sure enough to today, they are a pain to them. So they're looking for a warrior, not a righteous person. So God says, you know what? I'm going to put my spirit upon Saul as a matter of grace. But Saul going to mess you up. Because you did not follow my direction. Okay, here's a key statement. God is going to always give us free will. He is never going to take that from us. Why? Because he made us in his image. Because God made us in his image, the image was, was about God's image. He could sovereignly decide to do whatever he decided to do, whenever he wants to do. So since he gave us his image, we got free will. We could decide to walk with God or decide not to walk with God. But in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13, he says, you could walk away from me anytime, but when you face me day one day by and by, you will have to account for my word. Proverbs 13, 13 says, you can ignore my Bible, but you will face me one day and I will bring up the same Bible you ignored. But he gives you free will. Do what you want to do, whenever you want to do it. So he says, okay, pick your king. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. He says this. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, he looked down to verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people. 
in regard to all that they say to you, because Samuel was struggling with what they were saying and what they were doing. For they have rejected, they have not rejected you, for they have rejected me from being king over them. They don't want me to be king. So he says, look, look at chapter 9, verse 6. He says this. This man is a mighty man of valor. First verse 1, bottom part of verse 1 of chapter 9. He had a son whose name was Saul, a choice and handsome man. He looked just like your pastor. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Scratch that off. He says, <laughs> that was a Floydian slip, I'm sorry. And there was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. And his shoulders, and, 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 and from his shoulders up, he was taller than any of the people. You see what their selection was? Very secular. We're going to find somebody that's handsome, that's tall, that stands above the people. That we know his background of fighting and winning wars, of winning against different tribal problems. That's the man we want. See? What are they doing? They're following their own reasoning and logic. So God says, the minute you turn off your own, my word, to your own reasoning and logic, you have rejected me. And just like I read in Deuteronomy, then your minds become dark. I mean, in Romans chapter 1, your minds become dark, can't understand nothing God is saying, and angry. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, verse chapter 8, verse 5 through 9 says, he says, you become angry and hostile towards God. How dare God tell me what to do? I know what to do. He says, it goes from darkness to hostility. He says this, look at verse 6, and he said, behold, now, there's a man of God in this city, a man held in honor. All he says during, surely comes true. They're looking for Samuel. Now, let's go get him to do what we want him to do. Let's go find preachers all over, all over America to say what we need to say. So we could say, that, well, the preachers agree. The preachers are saying we need to vote for this person. The preachers are saying we got to issue the abortion and homosexuality. The preachers are saying this, so we need to go ahead and do it because the preachers say it. None of this stuff that's happening today, the Bible hasn't discussed. We just like to close it. Because we have Google and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and whatever whack whack we got. We got CNN, NSNBC, we got Fox News, we got our own preachers now. So we could tell God what we think. And they got money, so they must be doing it right. And since they got the money and they look to be rich, then we, they must, this is what I want. Same mindset. He says right here, look at chapter 12. In verse 19, he says, but you have today rejected your God who delivers you from all your calamities. God is a very jealous God. One day read Exodus 34, verse 34. He says, I am a jealous, my name is jealous. I don't like nobody taking my space. I delivered you. Where was this man named Saul? I got you to the Red Sea. Where was Saul? I got you out of the hands of Pharaoh. Where was Saul? And now you're going to tell me because he's tall and strapping, you dropped me for him? You don't wait for me to tell you who the king is? All right, here you go. You want Saul? For 40 years, you're going to have a mess on your hands. He says, no, but let the king over us now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord. He says, okay, here you go. Present yourselves. Get your tribes, your clans. Come before me. Let's rock. Do your thing. I'm not getting in your way. I've given you free will. Make up your mind. This is what you want. Have it. <laughs> Sometimes that same thing I tell people when they want to get married. I said, God, this man ain't saved. But he got a job. He got this. He got I said, but he ain't saved. Well, Pastor Kenny, you got to marry me. No, no, no. That's your free will. I still got one. 
That ain't no marriage. So he's a wolf. Oh, no, he's not a wolf. He's just dressed up in sheep clothing right now, but it gets hot. Okay? I can't marry you. Pastor Ken says, hey, I've had all these things over 30 years. Pastor Ken says, come on, come on, man, he's a good man. I know he's a Muslim, and I'm a Christian, but he's a good man. I'm going, I can't have any mixtures like that, because the Bible says I can't. But Pastor Ken, you don't understand, you know. I, 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 I'm going past this age now. I'm, I'm like 30-something. I'm going, it's better to be 30, 40, and lonely than messed up. So, you know, so... I, I can't help you get messed up. But good only comes from God, so this man can't be good for long if he don't know God. And I got a question for you. I got in trouble for this question, I must admit. I got a question for you. The Bible says light has no fellowship with darkness, so how are you finding fellowship right now? So it got quiet in my office, and we just moved on to the no. <laughs> Okay, so, so, so the first thing, the first thing is you cannot go out and select somebody that God is saying, hey, he's not, he's not approved. So the question is, what does God gravitate to for approval? That's the question. So to answer that question, we got to go further down here, and we're going to go down to 1 Samuel chapter 24. Look, go, go down to 1 Samuel chapter 24. And it's going to teach us what does gra God gravitate to. What does he gravitate to? What, what does God see that makes him move in a certain direction? What does God see? Okay? Now, now, now before I do this, please remember that there's different kinds of leadership in God's structure. There's, there's four kind of different, there's, there's four of them. One is theocratic Theocratic leadership is where a person gets to decide what God wants and God, Theo, God, leads to how the person leads. God is not into voting or what they may think. He doesn't care. He doesn't, he, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 through 11 says, I really don't care what you think. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, your wisdom is foolishness to me. Do not lead to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge me. It's theocratic. I lead you, you just do what I say, but you could implement what I say in whatever way you choose. You no, know, God says get married. He doesn't say the person has to be Denzel Washington on Halle Berry. I, I, just, I just put myself in, in the time zone there, okay? Okay? Angelique uh, laced me up. I said laced up, girl. She laced me up. But I can't remember the guy's name she laced me up with. That everybody's looking at. I think he was in some movie where he was boxing somebody. Uh, it's all good. Don't worry about it. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Back in the day when Denzel was walking around, my wife go, Oh, look at Denzel. I said, No, look at me. I'm... He don't pay no bills up in here. I even started trying to walk like Denzel, you know. It didn't work, though. It didn't work. She wanted to see all of Denzel's movies. <laughs> so, so some people still do the same thing today, you know. So, so this theocratic leadership, you got freedom. You can go marry who you want to marry so long they're saved. The Bible don't say that they be white, black, Asian. You don't even, even get into colors. As long as the person is saved, marry them. He don't care. So the application of his word, so long as it stays contextually correct, the application, we could use our imaginations. He doesn't care. I tell couples in intimacy in marriage, he doesn't say he has no rules in marriage for intimacy. None. It's outside of marriage, he says, don't get half sexual intercourse out before marriage. But inside of marriage, he's silent. Use your imagination. Doesn't care. Don't leave church yet. Calm down. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so please understand, please understand, he's committed to a theocratic leadership. Democratic leadership is the next one. Democratic leadership is where you get to go vote who you want. It never happens in the church. At Living Word Fellowship Church, there's no pul pulpit committee. I'm already doing what the Bible says. Find a young man like Timothy, disciple him. He just happened to be my son. 
and put them in place, and then the, the, the elders have to approve that he's actually ready. That's the structure we're already putting in place at Living Word. Because that's the structure the Bible has. Why? The church is theocratic. It's not democratic. So the people don't get to vote who the pastor is. They get to prove that they agree with the elders, yes. But they don't get to put your pulpit committee preaching out the preaching out the preaching out the preaching. And then the person, oh, I like him. I never forget going to a church one time and they liked me. That's why God protected me so I could start Living Word. And... On the way out the door, the woman scratched me in the middle of my hand with my wife right next to me. I said, I don't like y'all. <laughs> I left. I never went back. Look me dead in the eye with my wife standing right there and go, hmm, you're handsome. I'm going, if you're going to disrespect my wife like that. <laughs> so please understand, it's not a democratic process. That's democratic. And that's why he says you go vote for your judges and your rulers. Because you're in a democratic system. But you have a theocratic system when you walk out the church. You can't turn off the theocratic system when you walk out the church to go do a democratic process. That's why I need you to vote. Because you keep the theocratic going in the democratic. Are you with me? Okay. Then you have the autocratic. Autocratic is a person, go to Mark chapter 10 for a quick minute because I want you to see this in the scriptures that Paul Canning is not just talking. I want you to see it, that what I'm saying to you is smack out the Bible and it's been talking and I could do this message for, for three weeks and still come up with information. I'm actually summarizing this. In Mark chapter 10, he says in verse 41, this is autocratic leadership. Autocratic leadership doesn't care what God has to say, doesn't even care what people think. It's going to do what it's going to do because it's certain, they believe themselves to be whatever they choose to believe themselves to be. That is called autocratic leadership. He says in verse 41 of chapter 10, he says, hearing this, the 10 began to feel indignant, James and John, calling them to himself. Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, meaning they don't care what I think. They're their own lord. What had happened with Saul? Saul became autocratic. I'm going to go to the temple and eat with bread what I want to eat. I'm going to do what I want to do because I'm king. He moved from a theocratic system to an autocratic system and he canceled God. But God could have seen that far ahead when he says, don't pick Saul. Don't pick, let me pick the person. Watch this, watch this, watch this. I don't mind you having a king. Let me choose them for you. See, the persons, the rulers, they recognize as rulers, Lord over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. They are not interested in what you think. That's autocratic. And God is going, that's not the leadership I choose. I want democratic functioning from an autocratic system. Theocratic system. Not autocratic. So who, what leads Christ to pick people when there's no perfect person on this earth. Don't exist. If you think you're perfect, you just became self-righteous. There's no perfect person on this planet. They don't exist. All right, let me say this for married couples. You don't have a perfect person. Okay? If you think you, you should have a perfect person, look in the mirror. You'll see another imperfect person. Okay? So how does God, in an imperfect world... Pick a king. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'm glad you asked. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24. How does God do this? How does God come to a point where he says, I am picking the king because I am the autocratic leader leading you through a, I am the, the, the theocratic leader leading you to a person who's a servant leader. That's God's leader. But I know they're not perfect because you got Saul acting up sinfully, but we know the story about David. David raped a woman and then killed her husband. I know what you're going to say. He slept with Bathsheba. I call it rape. When you take a m soldiers with, with knives and daggers to a woman's house and demand she comes and sleep in your bedroom and you never ask her permission, I don't see the difference between that and some man walking up to a woman with a gun in his hand saying, come with me or you die. The difference is not much different. It's very similar. So David raped Bathsheba and then he turned around and killed her husband. So obviously David wasn't perfect. 
So here's what God says about how he chooses somebody knowing that they're going to be imperfect. In chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, this is what he says. David is speaking to Saul. Let me get a backdrop to this quickly. David was speaking to Saul. What he said to Saul was, I could have killed you. You were sleeping in a cave, went in the cave, saw you sleeping in the cave. I could have killed you. What I did was I cut off the hem of your garment, which meant that I just took away your kingship. They always wear a hem on their garment, and that means I'm the king. Everybody can have a garment, but the king is the only one with a little hem on the garment that has this little fancy thing like some women wear, you know. They got this little thing at the edge there that looks beautiful. He says, when he goes and cuts it off, he is saying, I chose to be king. So David said, I sinned against God. I got to come back and tell you I'm sorry. I cannot do that. I cannot take away from you the leadership that God has called you to provide. Only God can decide that. Because I'm under God. He is a theocratic leader of my life. When I sin, I got to fix it. Same thing you would see when he sins. He goes to Nathan. Nathan, I sin. What is God saying? Get out the city, David. Get out the city. Yes, sir. I'm out the city. So what is God choosing? Look at verse 12. May the Lord, David is speaking now that Saul is awake and he's talking to him. May the Lord judge between you and me. I may the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. It's wrong. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. In other words, he's saying, I was wrong, but I'm not wicked. Wicked, let me define wicked. Because some folks are not just sinful, they're wicked. Sinful is when I know what to do, but I made you know, free will and I turn around and didn't do it. Wicked is when I turn around and didn't do it and I don't care to turn back. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a strategy as to how to get you once I decide I'm going to sin. So I'm going to put together strategies, structures, so I'm going to get you back. And I'm going to hurt you in the process. That's wicked. David said, I could not let wickedness continue. So I stopped at sin. Watch carefully. <clears throat> Verse 15 he says, The Lord therefore be judge and decide between you and me. And may he see and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. I got to stay on to you even though you're messing up. Look at verse 16, and when David finished speaking these words to Saul, and Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? Then Saul lifted up his voice and wept because he knew he was wrong. And he said to David, you are more righteous than I. He didn't say you were perfect. He said you were righteous. In other words, when you hear the word of God, you are more quicker to respond to what God is saying than I ever will. I know I'm wicked. I don't respond back. When you hear the word of God, the fact that you would put your life at risk to come in front of me when you know I want to kill you and still come in front of me and repent in front of me, you would still do that? It shows that you're righteous, meaning you're committed to live by faith, believing that God will protect you when you're in front of a man that want to kill you because it was right to do what God says and that meant I will put myself at the point of being killed because it's the right thing to do before God. So you're righteous, David. I'm never there. That's why God selects this key thing, character. In the midst of imperfections, what God selects are people of character. People, wise people of character, even though they're imperfect. God can work through the person that's got a character, but the person that is, is a blatantly wicked, he's not working through. So even though the person may make mistakes, even though the person may not make the right decisions, God still has a place he could work through because the person is a person of character. So God doesn't pick perfect people. He picked people who have character that he could work through. Why is that? I'm glad you asked. Turn to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Best way to find Joshua is to go to your table of content. It will help you out. Okay, now, in Joshua chapter 5, this is what God is saying that is huge, huge before God. You and I can decide at any point in time to not do what God says, free will, any point in time. 
People know church were today was today. Some people chose not to come. It's obvious. They thought Pierre and I are out or something. They're not here. Choice. God didn't go, okay, you're dead 10 seconds after 11 o'clock. Free will. You know, I, I can get on the highway and I could speed or I could drive the speed limit. It's my choice, but I can't remove the consequences. I was driving down in West New York yesterday and a cop pulled up behind me. You know, he didn't care. You know, I, I was thinking, though, this is funny how, how you got to pray over your spirit. God, the first thing I thought about is maybe I should put on my license plate, Dr. Canning's living word. <laughs> That's funny how your mind just goes in and say, God, forgive me for I know not what I think. Because <laughs> many of the cops park in the parking lot here. They park right here and decide they do their paperwork. And I tell them, yeah, tell everybody it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking if they park here, guess what? Less people in here. So that's why I encourage them. I go by their car. I do stand far back. I do have my hands up. <laughs> I want to put on my shirt. This is not a target. <laughs> but I do tell them, come as much as you want. Do all your paperwork right here. We're happy for you to do it. So, I, so because of that, that hit my head. But at the end of the day, when I saw the cop, what does it make me do? Adjust. But I still had the free will to adjust or not adjust. I still had the choice. Free will. God says, hey, I'm going to tell you what to do, but you can never, please hear this, in this when I read this verse, you could never, ever change my agenda and what I'm going to do. You can never change it. You, you can neglect it. You can just quickly turn to Proverbs 13, 13. Just for a quick minute. Stay, stay in Joshua. And quickly turn to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13. I want you to see. You could move away from it. You could skip church. You could do what church the way you want. You, you could do your money the way you want. You could decide who you want to date. You could decide if you want to date a man as a man, a woman as a woman. That's your choice. But it doesn't change what I'm going to do. Ever. And one of these days, I will hold you accountable to it. Because there ain't no new Bible in heaven. It's just a bigger version. Because he couldn't write everything, John would say. In, John, in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13, he says this. The one who despises the word will be in debt to it. But the one who fears the commandment of the Lord will be rewarded. Still your choice. And that's why I wrote Joshua chapter 5. Jump to Joshua, Joshua chapter 5. Go with me to verse 13. And I want you to see, and I'm, 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 I'm popping around here in history, couldn't get this any better than this, no matter how I structured this. But I, I want you to see this in history. They, they are outside the promised land, and Moses says to them, this is how you pick a king. They go into the promised land, spread out everywhere in the promised land, and they decided we are going to not just pick judges and officers. We're going to decide we're going to pick a king. And they went out and picked what they wanted to. Before they actually went into the promised land, Joshua ran into the Lord of hosts because leaders change from Moses to Joshua. And this is what the Lord of hosts said before he walked up in there. Don't watch, watch carefully. I didn't say the Lord. I didn't say God. I said the Lord of host. When the Bible says host, you can't count the angels. So in other words, you see me here, Joshua, but behind me, there's a numerous angels and you can't stop nothing. Because when I move, I move. And I don't ride donkeys. I don't ride elephants. I am the Lord. I am the side. And you could make your choice right now. Jesus, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You could choose what you want to choose, but at the end of the day, when the story's all done, you're still going to have to run into, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You can't change that. You got no money, no power, no nothing. No political bandwidth, nothing to change that. Joshua, you got a two million people behind you. But you don't know who's behind me. What you going to do, Joshua? Look at verse 13. 
Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho, they were ready to get in the promised land. He lifted up his eyes and behold, and looked and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn. Uh, you know what that means, right? You know, somebody comes up to you and, and talk crazy like, man, what you going to do? No, nothing in the hands. But when they do this, <laughs> it's a dude. And it's up to you what you're going to do. And they're waving that in front of you. You start speaking in tongues. You know? See? He got a sword drawn. And he says, Joshua went out to him. That's what I love about Joshua. Joshua didn't go, okay. Joshua went out to him. Joshua's the warrior, man. I call Joshua one of my gangster leaders in the Bible. You know? I used to work as a probation officer in the hood, man. You know a person that's in the hood, hood, and a person that happened to live there, I wish they could get out. A person that's hood, hood, you could have a gun in front of you, and they go, what you going to do, man? They, they walk up to you, look you dead in the eye like, what you going to do? Is that all you got? I mean, it's different. When that person, when I walk up to that person as a probation officer, and they go, what you here for? Who you talking to? I start speaking in tongues. You know what, man? You know, if we're going <laughs> to... That's a different dude. The other person that comes and says, hey, there's a probation officer over here, man. He's looking for somebody. Oh, man, they're backing up. You know, you could walk up in there. But the other guy, it's like, I'm going to come back tomorrow. It's okay. <laughs> it's a different attitude. They're not afraid of nothing. Josh was saying, sword drawn, Lord of hosts, I'm walking up. Because they believed that Joshua was a general. That's how he knew Moses. He was a general in the Egyptian army. And he was a warrior of warriors. And Joshua's fought many wars. So Joshua ain't backing up. But Joshua says, the way you look, whose side are you on? Watch this carefully. In other words, Joshua said, I'm coming up on you. But I know, ain't no point fighting you. Look at what he says. He says, and he said, no, no. He says, he says are you for us or for the adversaries? And he said to him, no, rather I indeed come now as captain of the Lord of hosts. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth. And Joshua bowed before him. This warrior of key man has fought in many wars and said to him, What has the Lord to say to thy servant? And the captain of the host said to him, Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet. For the place where you're standing is holy. And guess what Joshua did? Yes, sir. <laughs> we can do this. That's what God is saying right now. You can go vote for who you want. But I am the Lord of hosts. I'm still in control. It's your choice. But when you decide to walk up on me, you better recognize you got to pick holiness. You got to pick righteousness. You got to pick what I decide to pick. You got to pick somebody of character. You got to let me theocratically lead your life as you walk in front of this boot. You have to decide that the person of character is who you choose, not a person of your own will and understanding. You have to let me be a theocratic leader in your life. And that brings me to a very controversial point here. Now, y'all hold your seat because it's going to get pretty controversial right up in here. And here it goes. I'm going to tell you bluntly where I'm going. You have to guess. There's no implicit message you have to worry about today. And where do we go then with this homosexuality and abortion? Where do we go then when we start talking about this? Here's the first thing we got to look at. Let, let, let me develop it. So don't, don't start tripping. Just let me develop this process forward. Homosexual and abortion is wrong. <laughs> Uh, homos uh, abortion, the Bible says, at the point of birth, point of, of conception, the baby is a human being. David said, in sin, I was conceived. I was I, personal person. I was conceived. So the Bible is saying, the minute the sperm and the egg come together, and the plasmatic development initiates automatically under his powerful control. The person is a person. And at that point, you have no authority to decide who is born and who dies. I am the one who gave life. I decide when it dies. Every child is a gift from God. I get to decide this. You don't. 
So you, I don't care how you frame this in homosexuality. I read you Romans chapter 1. He says homosexuality is a result of people using their own intelligence, following how they think, speculation about what they believe. And he says, when you do that, I'll turn you over to a lust you've been hiding. And you're going to whoop the man as a man. You're going to whoop the woman as a woman. So when people say to me, I honestly have a desire for not a man, I said, it's, I get it. It's true. You do feel it. And many preachers go, what? I go, yes, you feel it. It's real to you because it's true. What you feel, the Bible says he's going to hand it over to you. But we got to look at why it got there. I don't deny that they feel that way. But he said it's sinful. He said he created sex for children. That's why anybody don't want to have children, they got a lot of work to do to stop it. I made the male and female to be fruitful and multiply. I made sexuality. I never put a prefix on sexuality. You did. I never did. I called it sex. And I said I gave you a passion as a man for a woman, 1 Corinthians 7, and a woman for a man. I gave you that passion. When you go in the wrong direction, you created your own passions. You can't dance this. That's what the scriptures say. But the issue in front of us that I'm going to work my way through is the fact that God still gives people free will. That's the issue that I want to walk through for a minute. So just walk with me. The first place we're going to go is Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. This is what he said in Romans chapter 3. He says, when you start creating laws... When you, people have free will, what you end up having is people's depravity, sinful nature coming out worse than you've ever seen it. The minute you create, I'm going to put it this way. Anybody had a two-year-old child? If you bake cookies and you just put the cookies away to bless the child another day, no problems. But the mistake that you would make is to bake the cookies and tell the child with it nice and warm on the counter, sitting on a plate, five senses working, say, you can't eat it right now. You just created a monster. (laughs) That's the worst thing you could do. The worst thing you could do is to tell a 16-year-old with the keys on the counter, walking out the door, don't drive the car. Worst thing. They start to show you, I'm a gangster. They're going to eat the cookie, crumbs around their mouth and tell you, I was born in sin, you knew that, you shouldn't have left the cookies right there. And they're going to look at you and go, did you eat the cookies? No. Everybody said to, everybody says about a child, they, 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 they always say, you know, um, you know, children are so sweet and all this other stuff. I said, I, when my sons were born, when my son, uh, the son, both of them had children, I look at them and I said, this child was born with an empty mainframe. Because God can give you every chance to make a deposit. Give you the authority to make it happen. Structure you to make it. You could eat. That's why you name the child. You name the child because he, that means you have authority. Okay? That's why the man named the woman. Not God didn't name the woman in the Garden of Eden. It's senses of authority. When Moses says, who do you say that you are? I am that I am. I don't have a name. Nobody named me. Naming means authority. I'm going to give you the authority to do this. That's why the woman carries the man's last name, authority. So understand, (laughs) when, when, when a person has authority over this child, the child thus learns the first word that tells you, I'm a gangster. As soon as they turn to, without any information being deposited, they'll tell you no. And they look you dead in the eye. They know they don't have a job. They know they barely know how to brush their teeth. They know they got a bed that they need. They know you have the authority to whip them. But that's how gangster they could be. They could know all of that information and still look you in the eye and say, no. I want to know what your problem is. If you say, don't you dare tell me no, some of them will hit you back. Pow. I've seen some kids do that. You slap them, guess what they do? Slap you back. What are they telling you? You're raising a gangster. Get used to this. This is where we're going to be. 
but you got the authority to do what you want to do. God is saying, when a man turned away from him, he had a choice in the garden. He had the tree of good and evil and the tree of life. I put the tree of good and evil in the middle of the garden, so every day he has to walk by this tree. He had all the time in the world, but if he's going to pick from the tree of life, he has to purposefully go to the spot that I choose because his will is sincere. His will is committed. He's showing that I'm sincere about what I want to do, and I'm going over to the tree of life, and I'm going to pick it. I am making a choice. I didn't rub past it so much. I got to do it. No, I rub past the good and evil, but not the tree of life. Man willfully said, I'm doing this. God said, you just turned your will over to a nature you cannot control. You can't do it. The Bible says you become a slave to the flesh. That's why your eyes go places you don't want it to. Your tongue says things you don't want it to. You go, oops, wasn't supposed to cuss, but it's already gone. See, you lost control over your life when you go to sin because you just park yourself in a nature that you cannot control. You got to turn your life over to me by believing I'm Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. You got a purpose to go pick from the tree of life and that's when you decide to turn your will over to me. And when you do that, he says, I'm the only one that could rescue you from the bondage of sin because you're lost. So when you start giving people laws that are like that, the Bible says you're going to get some depraved stuff coming out of them. Look at Romans chapter 8, chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Proverbs 13, 13. Because of my, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in my sight, in his sight. Can't justify yourself before God trying it your way. Cannot be saved by works. He says, for, the, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. In other words... The more laws you come out with for abortion is the more people will become very depraved about it. People will go, they'll take these babies two months in out of the womb, kill the child. All kinds of craziness will take place because all you did with creating laws was expose the depravity of man. And the more laws you create is the more depraved man will show himself to be. I'm giving you an example of that smack dab in the Old Testament with the Jews. The more laws I gave them is the worse they got. And the more they got worse is the more depraved they got. They even start sleeping with animals. That's how depraved they got. So that's why the Bible is saying, a living word, that's why there's a new. Because I see a different approach to abortion. It's to fight for life. What I mean by that is the church is salt and life and light. So if the church does its job, because God is only committed to two organizations, two organisms actually, the family and church. He's not committed to nothing else. Okay, so if the church and the family does a job, you would impact the heart of the woman. When you impact the heart of the woman, the woman would then question whether to have an abortion or not. And therefore make the right decision because the heart, the character has been changed. The person has come to a knowledge of God. The person has let the Holy Spirit impact their life. And the more the Holy Spirit impacts their life, the more the Holy Spirit transforms their life, is the more the person is going to go, I have to save life. Because they're now choosing God's influence on their life when it comes to abortion. So that's why there's a new here. The fight for life. Give women a chance to say, hey, I could, do an, I could do an adoption situation. I can get my baby, but I don't have any medical care. Let me, a, a new, help me find medical care for the child while it's in my womb. I'm giving options. So, okay, man, I'm struggling with pampers and all this other stuff. We could find organizations that would give the woman pampers and food, all these different things. So she could now make decisions that is not as drastically hopeless as it once was. Because when God changes a person's heart, abortion is over. They'll pick from the tree of life. They'll pick a man as a woman. A woman 
A man will pick a woman because God has changed who they are. That's why, for me, you can't take away free will and then you can't give free will when it's sinful laws. It gets worse. That's what the scriptures teach. So somebody says to me, well, what are you trying to say? You're trying to dance between the covers? Oh, slow a minute. I'm not trying to tell you what to believe. My job is to give you the information. But if you, if you, if you look at the information, this is what God is saying. What God is saying is, don't take away somebody's free will, but seek to get my will to become their will so that my will being their will theocratically would lead them to save lives. You say you can't take it away from them because when you try to take it away from them, the gangster come out of them and they're going to fight you back and do what they want to do because they're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and God, they're going to do what the God they want to do. But if you said to them, you have a free will, but choose the tree of life. Come, let me share the gospel with you. Come, let me share the word of God with you. Let me share the love of God for you. Let me support you in the hard time you feel you're going through. Then that person will see the love of Christ and the love of Christ will change their heart and the change in their heart would lead them in their free will to make decisions that please God. That's what I believe it is. You say that's crazy, Cannings. Jesus Christ would say, oh no, slow your roll. I was born in Bethlehem. And when I was born in Bethlehem, Herod calls these, these elders together. Where is he born? Bethlehem. On Herod's free will, Herod killed a bunch of babies. And Christ never stopped it. Elijah, a man of God. Hundreds of prophets were killed. And God never stopped it. Free will. The judgment is high. The consequences, high. Jesus Christ touched a man born blind. Healed him. Walk on water. Five loaves, two fishes. Miracle after miracle. <laughs> Lazarus dead four days. Bring him back to life. But at the cross... You could say crucify him. You could say, forgive me, O Lord. Still your choice. He never on earth, walking on earth, took free will from people. Even when it came to many babies dying. God doesn't take away who he is. He gave us a free will. But what he says is, when I change your heart, Peter would say, forgive me. When I change your heart, Mary Madeline would say, could I follow you? When I change your heart, Lazarus who ripped off people would say, come to my house. When I change your heart, I see your heart would come to me and you would say, yes, Lord, I, must, I will follow you. My brother that didn't believe in me would say, yes, he's my master. He is my savior. People will turn to me because when I change your heart, you will choose God. And when you choose God, you choose life. When you choose God, you choose righteousness. When you choose God, you choose holiness. When you choose God, you choose a character that blesses God. When you choose God. But you can't go in and tell people what to do. They just get gangster. My time is up. It's been up a long time ago. But I say this to you in closing. It is not people in our world that has failed. It's we. It's us. Is. We want to come to church and just do church. Do church the way we want, the way we, how we choose, what we want to do, how we want to be, how we want to feel, what we want to think, and all this other stuff. We want to do church what kind of way we want to do church. <laughs> and we're not interested in God. So the most powerful organism God has, we, we get kids, but we don't want to raise them. The most powerful organism that we have, the most powerful organism we have, the family we don't take time for it. We'd rather buy houses and work two jobs than raise our kids. The organism of family and church is God's resolution. 
So when this world is getting worse and we are playing games, we end up riding donkeys and elephants rather than choosing God to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what is lacking in our culture. That's what is wrong in our culture. And I challenge you to choose Christ so that he he decides how you vote. So his theocratic leadership functions powerfully in a democratic structure. Let us stand. We're excited that you have joined us and I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart and we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here to find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.